Are you sure that you flew with Amos Yadlin to the Iraqi uh, nuclear reactor, or did you? No, we missed you. Don't. So, can you please tell us why you were in Ophira in Sharm el Sheikh on the 5th and the 6th of October, and uh, how the uh, war caught you? And you can also mention the film. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, I'm sorry for the delay. I have this uh, thing about fixing my cars uh, on my own. And uh, yesterday, uh, I, I, uh, I had to I, I had to start uh, um, fixing my car. And today, I was spent a lot of time under it without a watch. So you know, got lost track of time, sort of thing. Well. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and live up to the uh, old British saying, saying the older you get, the bravest you become. The braver you become. I was a young pilot in 1973. A uh, captain, I just uh, became captain uh, a month before. And I was uh, one of the uh, junior pilots in my squadron and uh, not one of the best of them, to say the least. And um, if you remember September 13th, when, well, uh, the day before, uh, there was uh, uh, Squadron 101 took an aerial photo of uh, the Lebanese uh, shoreline, and uh, Syrian MiGs were uh, it tried to intercept it, and they had to run uh, back home. The next day, they tried to take the photo again, and uh, there were two formations, uh, three formations of uh, mirages and uh, phantoms from 107 were waiting uh, down below, and the uh, MiGs uh, went right at it, uh, but then they um, got their own back and uh, shot down several MiGs, and only one mirage was uh, shot down, one of the... Uh, uh, Syrian pilots was taken uh, prisoner, and there was a uh, huge tension, which created this, uh, kind of, the kind of uh, atmosphere in the squadron. I can only tell you about our squadron because no one, because you know, as a captain, I didn't know much beyond that. So there was talk about having um, a day of battle. They, they were talking about a day of battle at the time. There would be a day of battle with the Syrians. So there were orders issued and uh, sp started to organize. And the intercepting uh, squadrons were on um, uh, alert in several uh, places, such as Bir Gafgafa and others, and in uh, Ophira, in, in uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Um, there was a different kind of uh, alert because. Um, a Libyan uh, airplane had been shot down by IAF um, airplanes by mistake. Um, two Libyan uh, planes took off from uh, Cairo International Airport and they flew um, eastwards instead of westwards. And they were flying east and uh, our, radar, our radar spotted them, our radar in Refidim. Uh, spotted them, and uh, the story was that the kind of some some kind of um, alert was uh, given that uh, terrorists uh, are going to kidn are going to hijack a plane and crash into an airbase, and they said that that was or they thought that that was the plane, so. Uh, so a uh, uh, formation was uh, scrambled towards uh, that uh, plane and they tried to warn it uh, and uh, they didn't uh, comply and eventually it was shot down. Now, it wasn't the uh, first time when a civilian plane is shot down. Uh, an Elal plane was shot down by the Bulgarians and uh, the Russians shot down a Korean plane. So. Well, there is a history of shooting down passenger planes. I don't want to go into it. But what happened was that 
um, the assessment was that Elal flights to South Africa were uh, under risk of retaliation. Elal started flying to South Africa only at night. And they uh, positioned uh, uh, some phantoms in Ophira and Sharim who could intercept by night in order for them to protect those uh, flights in case uh, it was necessary. Uh, could only fly as far as the um, uh, uh, middle of the Gulf, more or less, but uh, that's, that's how it was. And, and therefore, there were some phantom pilots there. And on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it was the uh, turn of our squadron, 107, and I, had to, I was supposed to go down there in 107, but uh, I uh, swapped with uh, another pilot, and uh, so it happened that I was there. On Yom Kippur, I got there on Friday. We would um, fly in um, pairs, and we would fly from our own uh, base, and then uh, um, and then uh, land in uh, 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 Sharem, and the pilots from Sharem would take off and then and land at home. So. This is where the story starts. You know, you could uh, paint it in many colors. It could be completely gray or completely colorful. Well, we landed and we started uh, getting organized and we didn't know anything. All we knew was that there's some tension in the north. With this, this is the asset that we had, you know, the only piece of information that we had, the only knowledge we had. I met the pilots and they went back north. We uh, stayed there. And on the uh, evening of, of Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur uh, evening, no flights, no allowed flights, so there is no um, uh, state of uh, alert for us, nothing. And, you know, we had to uh, pass the time somehow. Uh, at uh, the time, they used to provide uh, films. So just... Uh, as an anecdote, the uh, uh, film that we watched was called Torah, Torah, Torah. That was the Japanese code for the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 41. And what we saw there was a, a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. And we, saw, we see these two pilots in some uh, air base not in Pearl Harbor, and they were not uh, uh, under attack, so they had to take off. And, you know, that's what we were watching. And then 1 o'clock at night, 1 a.m., I, just as he, just like he heard the uh, um, the uh, uh, roar of the engines, I heard the Dakota landing. I heard the Dakota landing squeak with its uh, brakes squeaking. And yes, there was a Dakota there, and a few people got off it and disappeared. Okay, so we went back to our intercepting positions, went to sleep. Nine o'clock in the morning, we get up, and I, I get this call from operations. It was called Air 3 at the time. So, Ashel Schneer was on the line, may rest in peace, and he tells me, uh, Shalom, uh, is this the leader? Hello, is this the leader of 107? And I said, no, it's Nahumi from 107, there is no leader here. So, he got really uh, annoyed and he said, uh, no, we're two number two, and uh, there is no, no uh, leader here. The, we, don't, we don't have leaders in this kind of uh, position. So, he... Um, uh, put down the phone, and then after five minutes uh, later, he called us and said, five minutes to uh, intercept. Um, so I said, okay. I called back to the squadron, and I uh, said to the uh, to the guy over there, look, uh, um, they want an intercept, and uh, we don't have a leader. Now, in those days, being a leader in the uh, Air Force is like being a demigod or something. You know, only the very... Uh, best to become leaders uh, of uh, an intercepting pair. But I was one of the junior pilots, and I said to him, to, to Gillett, the operations officer, what do I do? He said, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to give you the squadron commander. His name was Specter, the Specter. So I said to him, uh, look, in five minutes they need an intercept here. Can you send us a leader or something? He said to me, no, we can't. So, you are now um, an intercept leader at 107, and this is how I became an intercept leader at 107. Well, I was 
filled with uh, excitement, but also, uh, you know, sort of fear. And I uh, started organizing things and, and uh, uh, went to the mechanics and I said to them, look, there's a change we have to uh, prepare me or whatever. And after 10 minutes or so, um, Colonel Yaknovo showed up uh, at the intercept position. I didn't know him. And uh, I, I could see he was a reservist. And he said to me, who are you? And I said, I'm Nahomi. Are you the commander around here? And uh, I said, well, yeah. Uh, I didn't say him. I said, yes, I am the commander. And he said to me, look, at 6 o'clock in the evening, there's going to be war. And I said, what? At 6 o'clock in the evening, a war is about to start, and there's a commando uh, attack. There's going to be a, com a commando attack on this base. How are you at uh, shooting down helicopters? Well, uh, unlike what you said, we never trained in, in uh, shooting down helicopters by night. I have no experience in that because we don't have a look-down radar. I mean, uh, we can uh, try and look as much as we, as we want, but it doesn't see anything. So we won't be able to see the helicopters. But, uh, you know, maybe there's a CBU. Uh, maybe there are some CBUs. There are some small bombs. Maybe we can hit them with those because we can't hit them with missiles. He says, okay, let's look for them. Well, I said I can't because uh, I, uh, on a five-minute alert, I can't go looking for them. You let me know. After about an hour, he calls me about one o'clock and he says, uh, I need uh, the uh, orders. Uh, I said, well, I can't because I have to remain in position. He said, do, do them where you are, wherever you are. I said, okay. And suddenly there's a siren going off. I'd never heard this, a, a real siren before. You know, at first I, I was just in shock and I didn't know what to do. And then we ran to the airplanes and I uh, got on the plane and it, it was possible to... Uh, talk by telebriefing uh, and, and there's a landline sort of thing, not a radio connection to uh, the control uh, unit and I called them, you know, and I asked what was going on and uh, they said to me, uh, be uh, ready instantaneously. I said, okay, what, what, do, what do you see? He says, well, I don't know. I see about 20 targets, about 20 MiGs. What do you mean? I say, uh, how far from here? Uh, about 20 miles. Where are they heading? Heading our way. I said, and, and you're saying I should take off immediately? He said, yes. Okay, so I said to my number two, um, you must, uh, we, we must leave now. We must uh, go now. Uh, and he says, no, but there's uh, um, an instruction that you can't go. I said, fuck off. You know, I just took off and my number two joined me and suddenly I saw on the runway all kinds of, you know, um, uh, cotton wool, like fluffy stuff. And I said to my number two, look, they're, they're bombing our runway. And he says, yes, I can see MiGs. Where do you see MiGs? So um, I said to him, uh, drop your uh, uh, petrol uh, uh, tanks. And that's what we did because we were about to go into battle and we turned back and I saw the MiGs and we started the battle. Now, I can't remember the entire um, way the, the battle uh, happened. You know, it's been, it was many years ago and I don't want to just make up things. But I, I have these single shots of, of snapshots of things happening. I remember like a, a snapshot, I see uh, a formation of MiGs pulling up uh, in, in preparation to, to bomb and we hadn't, we hadn't trained on that, you know, I didn't know what to do so I, I just flew in their direction and uh, I passed very close by to one of them and, and they sort of got a fright and uh, uh, banked away and um, eventually, I don't know, they must have disappeared somewhere and suddenly I saw a MiG right in front of me, it was the first for me and I sort of tried, uh, I don't know, I was, I was too near to fire a missile, so I, I don't know, I didn't know what to do. He was uh, banking sideways and I just couldn't do it. So I put the throttle 
back and I sort of backed up about one kilometer and I sent out and I fired a missile and he blew up. Now it was sort of black and red fire and I continued looking at him and my, my number two said, stop looking at him, there are so many others. I mean, everything is, is the absolute truth. Okay, we continued and there were another two MiGs and I was chasing them. And uh, again, I couldn't fire a missile, but I fired my cannons and I could see the bullets hitting him, but he, he didn't fall down. So uh, eventually he did, he did uh, fall down. Someone uh, uh, took a film of this and they could see the MiG falling, but I, I couldn't see that. And I said to my number two, we're not going to fly together. You're going, you're going to be above the runway and I'm going to the uh, Navy and uh, Brigade area. And we just uh, separated and we only talked to each other, but we said we can't do this together. We must separate. And it's also against the doctrine because the doctrine was that you don't fly a single in the IAF. I said, to him, you know, don't go chasing me. Just go and shoot them down as much as you can. And not... not in so many words, but that, that was the way, more, more or less. And then I remember also chasing a MiG-17, unable to, to, to uh, uh, catch up with him. And I don't understand. I'm a phantom, and he's a MiG-17, and I can't catch up with him. And then I uh, look in the mirror, and I can see that one of my engines uh, stalled. Um, apparently, when I fired the uh, cannon, uh, one of my engines uh, shut down. So I say to the controller, I have a problem. Uh, one of my engines is uh, down. You know, it all has the atmosphere of a, of a training sortie. I didn't even feel the, the reality of it. So I restarted it, and that MiG got away. But there were so many others, so it didn't really matter. Eventually, at the end of the battle, there were seven burning MiGs on the floor, on the ground. And I... I, I uh, say that there's another which was shot down into the sea, but the Air Force doesn't agree with that, so we'll leave that aside. And we had to land. We're out of fuel. We had to land. In the meantime, another uh, four of our airplanes uh, uh, got, to, got to us already. They had uh, um, come from Etzion, they came from uh, somewhere else, and uh, they were led by Gyor Chomsky, and they uh, arrived, but they didn't have any uh, fuel uh, left either, and uh, also another pair got us from far away. None of us had fuel, and there were eight um, airplanes, and on the runway there were two great big holes right in the middle. So we were circling around and around, and I said, okay, you know, who's going to land first, I say. And uh, I said, uh, Yavin, uh, Yavin uh, I said to Yavin, you, you uh, prepare for uh, ejection, and I'm going to land first. Now, they taught us how to land on uh, an aircraft carrier where the runway is really short. So they told us how to approach uh, such a runway and we uh, did just that. And I really had to stand on the brakes. My, my knees are still trembling as I remember that. And uh, I um, heard uh, another pilot uh, telling uh, someone about this uh, landing. Uh, I saw a phantom landing, he said, and uh, he took the only last third of the runway, 180 short, and uh, I didn't understand what it was. How, how do, uh, why do people land like that? So whatever I said in the lowest voice that I could muster, landing is possible. And uh, I uh, uh, got to the intercept position again, and people were starting to land as well, but as I got there, no mechanics were coming towards us, and people were running in all directions. Some car was passing by. Uh, total chaos. And I lifted up the, the canopy, and uh, we have the, these kind of stairs that you sort of press down. And, and uh, as soon as I go down the stairs, someone uh, can't, runs up to me and hugs me, and I said, what's going on? Uh, well, we saw this whole battle, and I said to him, we have to refuel because maybe we'll have to take off again. Um, I uh, got uh, so I got back to the position. Then I saw that there's a bomb which landed just uh, before the, the uh, where the airplanes were, and it 
this propeller was still spinning, but it didn't go off, and no one knew, knew what to do. You had to neutralize it, but people wouldn't come close to it because it might explode any minute. And uh, I said to myself, well, we better take off as quickly as possible before this explodes. And I went looking for the uh, uh, fueling tanker. I'm, in another minute, I'll be done. It's a special means that we have. So I went looking for the tanker, couldn't find it eventually. I found it and whatever, I said to him, go and uh, fuel me up immediately. And uh, we went up for another two hours, no one came along. And we landed and then uh, they said to us, well, get ready for helicopter attack. And I uh, suggested that everybody just take rifles and stand on the fences and that's it. I mean, there was nothing we could do. So we had an FN. Do you remember? Yeah, FN. Uh, so they, they explained to us how to uh, use it. And uh, we took FNs and we were standing on the fences waiting for helicopters. Eventually, uh, Kelt uh, arrived, uh, no helicopters, and it just got stuck and that's it.